Good morning, folks. It's 6.25 a.m. Here are today's observations from the Unit UK. EU on Africa. What's in the relationship? Cameron's EU plans suffer blow as Britain told to wait 10 years for treaty change. And Cameron's EU renegotiation strategy is very risky, says Barroso. US and Europe seek to end tariffs on each other's products and the EU ready with substantial financial aid to the Ukraine. Glad you're joining me. Don't forget to subscribe here. It makes all of our efforts worthwhile. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the UnitUK.com. Back in 2014, we reported that some 80 nations were gathering in Brussels for an EU-Africa summit dominated by conflict, trade and illegal migration. Here are some of the key facts and figures linking the two continents. Security, aid and development and trade. Over the last decade, the EU has carried out 14 peace missions, including six military operations in unrest-hit countries such as Mali, Democratic Republic of Congo and Somalia. The EU also carried out eight civilian missions to Guinea-Bissau, Southern Sudan and Niger, among others. Now, since 2004, more than 1.2 billion euros has been dispersed to support the African Union peacekeeping operations, including 575 million euros for the AU force in Somalia. Now, let's look at one of the mantras proposed by John Monet to the United Nations as taken from our Brave New Europe series on the website. In 1952, Monet stated in a speech at the United Nations that the nations of Europe should be guided towards a supranational state without their people understanding what is happening. This can be achieved by successive steps each disguised as having an economic purpose, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to a federation. Now, as you will see in f now, as you will see in from today's observations, those global continental unions are almost complete and indeed have been built upon exactly the premise of economic purpose. The European Union, Eurasian Union, North American Union, and the African Union. A solid foundation for a new world government, wouldn't you say? Of course, Big Cheese Dave Cameroni thinks he's going to have some semblance of input and control into this global regime. But as our deceptively innocuous looking Jean-Claude Juncker points out, it's a different story. In news that is likely to bolster calls for the UK's complete withdrawal from the EU, President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, has put the brakes on reforming the relations between member states and Brussels. Now, Mr Cameron has vowed to hold an in-out vote on Britain's membership of the EU in 2017, but only after a series of talks aimed at reconfiguring the UK's relationship with Brussels. But now he appears to have been told by Brussels chiefs now he appears to but now he appears to have been told Brussels chiefs will only negotiate two years after that date when Mr Juncker steps down from office. An official close to the EU's top politician told the Times no treaty change proposals are envisaged in <laughs> bollocks. No treaty change proposals are envisaged until after November 2019. British hopes for amendments are now likely to have to wait until as late as 2025 when EU treaties are scheduled to be overhauled. Next up, it's my old friend Manuel Barroso's turn to slap Big Dave for having a dip in the European Union cookie jar of directives and regulations. The former EU Commission president hinted that the Prime Minister's plan to deprive low-paid EU migrants of in-work benefits would face a stiff opposition, warning that Britain as an individual member state cannot impose to all the others its specific views. When we have 28 countries, it will be impossible to say that, let's say, the French can come to Britain to work in the city, but the Poles cannot come to Britain. This is not possible. This will be a violation of the principles of non-discrimination, 
Mr Barroso told the Today programme. It's getting very difficult to see what we voted you into Westminster for, Dave. Oh, yes, I remember now. Your love of gardening. The trade deal being negotiated between the United States and European Union could add $100 billion annually to the economies on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. But the issues are complex and there is no guarantee that an agreement will be reached anytime soon. The US and the 28 nation EU started negotiations nearly two years ago and resumed them again this week in New York. The US is the world's biggest individual economy and the EU collectively is even bigger. Even though the US and Europe collaborate militarily in the NATO alliance and annually carry out billions of dollars in business deals, existing tariffs and other barriers limit the economic activity from what it might be. Both Europe and the US say they want to eliminate custom duties on each other's products. Now, let me take you back to news point one. This can be achieved by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to a federation. Now, the treaty that provides these economic benefits is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, which, interestingly, neither Congress or the European Parliament have yet been allowed to read. Apparently, it's all being tidied up and drafted under the careful and considered eyes of the unelected EU Commission. <laughs> Sounds a lot like the Foreign and Commonwealth Office document 301048, if you ask me. You know, that document the UK government kept secret for 30 years, as it explains how Edward Heath would start the process of handing over sovereignty and governance of Britain to Brussels. Now, if you haven't seen our documentary film Betrayed, I've posted links for you below. And for the final article, let's dive behind the theatrical curtain of the UK political puppet show and take a look at some serious developments in Europe. Now, remember the foray over the Ukraine back in 2014 and Yanukovych's deliberation over where to ally Ukraine's interest? Let me take you back in our archives to 2014 and demonstrate the point. The European Union is ready to offer substantial financial aid to the Ukraine once it has a new government and should offer clear European perspective to Kiev, the EU's Economic and Monetary Affairs Commissioner Olli Rehn said on Sunday. Now, the Ukraine's parliament voted to remove President Viktor Yanukovych after three months of street protests. Yanukovych abandoned the capital to the opposition on Saturday and denounced what he described as a coup after several days of bloodshed this week that claimed 82 lives. <clears throat> now that doesn't sound to me like EU impartiality. So, remember, do visit our website, theunituk.com, for all the very latest news. You can find our page on Facebook by searching for The Unit UK, or one word. Join our community on Google+, Plus, where you can interact with us, voice your opinions, and post comments about our stories, and even get involved in the shows. For all the latest tweets as they happen, then follow us on Twitter, at The e Unit, and of course, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Here, here subscribe here. I'm Rick Timmis, observing for the unit UK.com. I'll see you soon. <laughs>